Hey everybody. So nice to see you again. It is so nice to see you again. And uh, I'm live streaming from our apartment here in the West Village. And it's Tuesday, March 23rd, 2021, the last time I looked. And uh, I thought to share some thoughts about working with Jeff Buckley. I know I've played and discussed uh, Jeff and I working together many times. But I was reminded that yesterday was an anniversary of the the last time Gods and Monsters played together as a band. Uh, we really only had a few occasions to play. I think about four times the lineup shifted a bit. But uh, on Sunday, March 23rd in 1992, we did a radio show for my friend Nick Hill called Live from the music faucet that went out over WFMU and it was broadcast from the old knitting factory on Houston Street. This was uh, a show that also featured Peter Stanfo, uh, three Peters actually, Peter Stanfo, Peter Blegvad, and Peter Case, all excellent singer songwriters and characters, and uh, I wound up working with Peter Stanfo having, this was the first time I'd actually met him at the show, but uh, we were on uh, as the second act that night, and uh, before us, I know Mark Rebo had a thing called the Cosmopolitans, Mark Rebo's Rootless Cosmopolitans, they were on at seven, and then at nine, we were on. And uh, it was a really good show, and there's clips I posted, I think this morning, on the timeline, a version of us doing uh, a song Dave Van Ronk, I think, had shown to Bob Dylan that was known as Dink Song. But uh, I didn't even know that at the time. I found it on a bootleg Dylan album I got in Amsterdam, or actually in Rotterdam, oh, uh, earlier that spring. And I was quite taken with his rendition of the song, but it was listed as if I had wings, or just wings on the bootleg. So it wasn't until later I found out that the lyrics concerned a washerwoman named Dink, and hence Dink's song. But anyway, I thought this is a fantastic number for Jeff and I to do. I was always working on expanding our repertoire, uh, writing original stuff, and also thinking of covers that would sound really great with Jeff's voice on it. So anyway, uh, we started that set solo and then did a full band set for about a half an hour. And uh, that was the last time we played as a band. And Jeff had decided to go solo uh, around that time. So I was a little bit, uh, <laughs> a little bit upset, but not really at the show. And you wouldn't see it from playing uh, in any of the clips. And there are there are full band clips of us doing the, the half hour set. But anyway, at this point in time, I just really want to concentrate on you know, loving reminiscences of anybody I ever worked with. Uh, and Jeff would be right near the top of the list, certainly is at the top of the list for sheer creativity. I've never ever met anybody uh, at any age who was as totally musical as Jeff Buckley, he could pretty much play and sing anything or a any kind of music that you might put before him. He also knew as a collaborator how to really get inside my guitar instrumentals, which always uh, came first in our collaborations, at least for 98% of the time, I think. The first thing we ever wrote together, we just composed on the spot, but I'd had a bit of the music lying around. Uh, so, I, you know, here I've got the, the Mojo Pin drone going, so I think I will start here with a little rendition of Mojo Pin, and then I'll give you some of that backstory.
that's essentially it. And uh, that is some of that music was built up in that spring before I met Jeff Buckley. And in fact, I met him at a tribute to his father, Tim Buckley, that was held at St. Anne's Church in Brooklyn in the late spring of 1991. And uh, my friend Hal Wilner, who sadly passed away of COVID uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, we really miss you, Hal. He called me up and said, I'd love you to do this tribute uh, to Tim. And I said, well, I love Tim Buckley's music. Thank you. Uh, I really did. And I remember exactly <laughs> listening to it for the first time. I think it was summer of 67 and Goodbye and Hello came out. And in some quarters, maybe the New York Times, it was described as uh, up there with Sgt. Pepper. So I had to check it out. And it didn't disappoint. It really is a very, very uh, beautiful, complex album, very ambitious album. Uh, so I recommend that. All of Tim's albums are worth checking out. And in part of the conversation, he said, oh, well, uh, Tim Buckley's son, Jeff, is around and uh, he's coming in specifically to play this concert. And I think you guys should work together and you'd be really good. Uh, that was the first time I heard that name, Jeff Buckley. And I said, I didn't know that Tim had a son. He said, well, neither did we, really, but he's contacted us and he wants to play at this tribute. So I think you guys would be great working together. And uh, I was open to the idea, as I usually am with collaborators, and people suggest stuff to me. Uh, you know, I think that's uh, always a great thing, a collaboration, because I've often remarked, often the result is much larger and in the end than maybe anything uh, the individuals might be capable of. Uh, these are the constituent parts that they're bringing to the table in these songs. So it was that uh, I went down to the church uh, for a run-through it's kind of a uh, an open rehearsal for the show, which was going to be two two days later. It's a beautiful spring day, and uh, I was there with a singer I was working with, a female vocalist, and we did one of Tim's songs called "The River," which is very haunting, which you can find on the Blue Afternoon album of Tim Buckley. And uh, Hal liked what he heard, and it went well. So uh, she took off, and I, I was packing up my gear in the uh, in the other room outside the main chapel of St. Anne's. And then this young man approached me who looked very much the spitting image of Tim Buckley as I recalled it, albeit a younger version. And he was very on fire, electric. He was just vibing me and popping his eyes. And uh, I couldn't help but notice him. And he said, I love your music, Gary Lucas. Uh, I love your guitar playing. And I read about you in Guitar Player. I know you work with Beefheart. I love that. And I want to work with you. So I was very flattered. And I said, well, come by tomorrow. And let's uh, start to work. So he did show up here. And uh, I had prepared oh, uh, an arrangement of the river. And I handed Jeff a mic. It had a some of these same uh, looping effects going on in the intro. Uh, kind of a raga, sped up raga figure running backwards and forwards during the song, like a cascading waterfall. And he started to sing, uh, and it was so beautiful. And uh, what, did I say it was the river? Now the song that we were supposed to work up is The King's Chain, which is from Tim's Sophronia album. And it's a haunting part of a trilogy uh, that's on that album. It's sort of a suite of music with an orchestra. But anyway, I compacted it into, into this atmospheric guitar arrangement where I started to play the opening chords and then I heard Jeff sing. And he just stunned me and I said, Jeff, you are amazing. That's incredible. Uh, you're a star. I'm sure I did say that. And he said, really? You think? Oh, man, you know, that's just, he was flattered, but very shy. 
And so I was inspired because at that point I was looking for a singer for Gods and Monsters in the future uh, as it wasn't really going well with my relationship with my female vocalist. And I was thinking in that point of time, I'd really like to get a male vocalist in here and do more of, honestly, Led Zeppelin, -y, <laughs> how would you say it? Led zeppelin -y type of music. Uh, anyway, I took him to lunch and right away we said, like, who are your favorite artists? Who do you like? And he liked, he named three and they were The Smiths, The Doors, and Led Zeppelin. And I really bonded with him over that because I loved all their music. And you'll notice they featured a guitar hero and a, a lead singer who worked in tandem together. So that's how I envisioned the group. And I, we came back from lunch and jammed out a song right then and there called Bluebird Blues. And it felt great. It went on for about 10 minutes. I have a tape of it somewhere. Uh, it's so dynamic and delightful to listen to. Uh, to this day, because we were really just discovering each other and kind of feeling out each other's moves with guitar and voice, and yeah, we had a kind of telepathy going there, in fact. So we then did uh, the concert, we worked out, uh, and I played on, I think, four things with Jeff in that concert, and uh, it was a beautiful night, and everyone who was there really noticed Jeff, the New York Times wrote it up, there was a picture that ran of uh, myself and the singer I w was working with and Jeff uh, in concert on one of the songs. Uh, so he was psyched, and uh, as was I, but then it was time for him to go back to LA, but we made kind of a, you know, uh, a pledge that we would work together again when we could. Uh, I mean, it's hard, often to work nowadays not so hard of course with the internet but in those days it was kind of to mail tapes to one another was a very slow process as was trying to do stuff in studios and fly in parts and nowadays it's much easier accomplished but uh, anyway in that summer I contacted him again because uh, the whole project I was working on at that point for Columbia Records fell apart, and uh, it was, I think I've told that story before, but, you know, I thought, oh, I'll call Jeff. He seemed to be, uh, you know, I was inspired, he was my ace in the home, to continue on in music, and he got on the phone from uh, Los Angeles and said, I'll be your singer, and uh, he was very excited about the prospect, as was I, so I, I felt you know, a lot more relaxed on about everything at that moment, and I knew I would be able to go forward in even maybe a better version of Gods and Monsters. So the next day I said, I have to now write some songs for us. And uh, we had that first one, and that was a possibility. But I had that music I'd already been working on, uh, at least the middle part of Mojo Pin, this part. and I, I liked it. It was something I'd filed away, kind of a bolero figure. And uh, anyway, I got in a very relaxed state of mind and just started improvising on the guitar. And it happened to be in drop D tuning, which is where the low E string goes down one whole step to D, low D. Now here it is normally. There's standard tuning. Drop D, you go. But the little galleon Kruger is really on its last legs. Okay, I have another amp in mind, folks. So soon, soon come a new uh, right-handed amp on the side. So anyway, I was just passing my fingers over the strings. This is how I often will write songs, you know, unconsciously, not really trying to put uh, attention on what I'm playing but listening for magic notes, and this figure came up. And 
And I thought, that sounds cool, that's great. Dude, let me play that again. So it was sort of a question and answer, you know what I mean? It was like, here's a question. Kind of a, uh, a yearning, uh, wistful question, hoping for a, a positive answer, but the answer comes back. Wait, here we go. The answer comes back. That sounds a little dark, doesn't it, and doomy, uh, in answer to the first question. Uh, anyway, I just uh, compiled a sequence of motifs over the next couple of days that seem to logically extend from this opening. And uh, until I had a finished instrumental, big believer in instrumentals as a foundation for songwriting. So I recorded that and then another instrumental, which became Grace, put them on a cassette. I had a dad, a pro dad player here, recorded them here right in this chair until they sounded good, and then mailed off the cassette to Jeff, who, when he got them, called me up from LA and said, they're beautiful. Okay, well, I'm gonna work on them, and I, I might be in New York in a couple of weeks. And lo and behold, he showed up several weeks later, I think in early August of 91, and he was playing bass in a road show to, to promote the film The Commitments, the Alan Parker film, which you may have seen about an Irish show band that gets together for a week out of just some uh, amateur players and within one week they're really tight, funky soul bands and they've amassed a big following and then of course they break up and now Caroline is smiling over there because she was actually friends with one of the other players in the show. What was his name, Caroline? And she's, she doesn't want to go out. Yesterday was Caroline's birthday. Let's give her a big hand. Anyway, we, we, we had fun. I took her out. And we're going out again tonight, yes. So anything to get away from uh, cooking in our kitchen. She's kind of needs a cleaning, but I digress. Uh, this film was really good and uh, Jeff, anyway, showed up. When they hit New York, they were gonna play a party to promote this film, this Alan Parker film, The Commitments. And he comes up and he said, okay, I give it a title to my two instrumentals. One was, And You Will, that's Mojo Pen. The other one was called Rise Up To Be. And Jeff said, you know that one, And You Will, now it's called Mojo Pen. Start playing. So I started to play and he started to sing lyrics Actually, uh, at that point, it was really, it was just poetry. He had written in a sketchbook that he carried around with him everywhere where he drew f very interesting and peculiar drawings, funny drawings, and also lyrical ideas and his diaries. It was all there in this online artist notebook you can get at uh, most art supply stores. And uh, that's where the mojo pen came from now. I have earlier versions with slightly different lyrics, but uh, we settled on one and then Grace was done the same way. And then Jeff said, I gotta record these. I gotta demo these, all right? So I assembled Gods and Monsters as it was then uh, constituted with Jared Nickerson on bass and Tony Lewis on drums, two excellent players that I love to work with. We had one rehearsal in a rehearsal studio in Chelsea, Jeff kind of sang with his back to us. And uh, I didn't pay much attention, though I had heard the song when he was singing it on my couch, and I had a tape of it. I was basically trying to just get the guitar right. And I thought, and this is how I often think, leave it to the other person, because often I think to put shackles on what they're intending to create with you along in the collaboration will spoil the collaboration. You know, I'm basically a believer of giving people their head, as it were, and letting them see what they can do. And I just have faith that, you know, in most cases, they're gonna shine when uh, approached like this, in, or treated like this, you know? I mean, it's a respectful way 
to work with people, not where one is the dominant figure or the other one, anyway. So we went into a recording studio called Krypton Studios the very next day or two days later, I think it was a Saturday afternoon, I gotta check the dates, but in one afternoon we, the band knocked out backing tracks for both Mojo Pin and Grace. And then Jeff came down and we had this magic hour with him doing his vocals. And uh, he added on Grace a harmonica, which is really cool. And you can hear the demos that come out. At least Grace is out officially on a record called Songs to No One, early work of myself and Jeff on Knitting Factory, check that out. Uh, and Mojo Pin has not officially come out uh, yet as an official release, but it's there. And it sounds really good <laughs> in revisiting it. I mean, it's all, it's all there. Plus there was an added hardcore section at the end where I go into a frenzy on guitar. It's a double time section with the band and Jeff being a big fan of Bad Brains and these other hardcore bands, Dinosaur Jr. that were out there at the time. He really goes to town uh, wailing and, and imprecating, what's the word I'm searching for? Anyway, raving uh, into the coda. But uh, it's a beautiful moment, uh, the whole song, both songs, I'm very proud of. And as I mentioned before, if people say, what's my best moment in music? I probably will think that that session is it because I was so convinced of the righteousness of this music that when I left the session, uh, and I left with just rough mixes on a debt, we didn't have time to even properly get anything but monitor mixes. I said, or I felt like, I've got the atomic bomb in my pocket here. Uh, this music is gonna shake the world, which it did. And it's still shaking it. And uh, thank you for everybody who keeps sending me nice messages. And today I got some tapes and a CD from Italy of a young player uh, because I feel honored that if these songs inspired you. I was inspired to work with Jeff in the collaboration uh, and honored. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm out there uh, just, you know, I'm still out there doing it and I feel good about it. So thank you for tuning in. Uh, I have more stories, but I'll finish with some music here. And let's see what's going on. Well, I just did John Schaefer's new, sorry, sound check. He has a, two programs on WMYC. PBS radio here. New sounds, which I must have been recorded on about 15 times. And another one called Soundcheck. And this Thursday, uh, I'll, I'll post the links. He's uh, going public with a session where I play four numbers, including Grace, on there as Rise Up To Be, the original instrumental and other music, and I'm interviewed by John, so I'm looking forward to that, and the clips will be posted, as will the whole session, and he's got a special web channel that's very high quality audio and video, I'm told, uh, so I'll, I'm looking forward to hearing how this is assembled this Thursday, and I'll post a link. And uh, a book just came in, that I thought was interesting, and it's uh, Nico in the Shadow of the Moon Goddess by her one-time boyfriend and collaborator Lutz Graf Ulbrich. And if you've seen the documentary Nico Icon, he has some very tender moments describing working with Nico near the final stages of her recording career, or a little bit in the mid career when she was in exile in Europe after her heyday in America solo and with the Velvet Underground. And, uh, and I'm really looking forward to reading more about Nico, who I've always loved. And I guess, okay, I'll play a little bit more here.
Thanks for listening.